put that down there. Appreciate everyone uh, being here and being in class tonight. And if you're uh, with, if you're on live streaming, appreciate that too. I'm echoing. I don't know if that's that might not be a great thing. Before we have uh, enter into class, let's uh, bow for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful for opportunity t tonight to assemble together to study another portion of Thy Word. Father, we're grateful for Your Word and its truthfulness, its simplicity, its rationality, and all those things that help us to become doers of the word and not hearers only. Father, we pray as we study tonight we might uh, understand the precepts of thy word, that we may make application to our lives to be better servants of yours. Father, we're mindful of those who are unable to be here tonight. We pray your continued blessings be upon them, and those that are uh, shut in, and those that are uh, helping those that are sick. Father, we pray that you'll uh, bless us all in your service, in Christ's name, amen. All right, we've been uh, looking at, for the past couple of weeks, issues, or current issues, facing the church. And uh, we've been basically breaking down the last couple of weeks about the difference between tolerance and relativism, and talking about how that fits into the postmodern age. And uh, if you're new to the class, that might seem like, Ooh, what's he talking about? But it's really simple to understand. Those that, uh, and we're talking about basically religious people uh, today, but not only that, it, it stems from our society in general. But relative, relativism is the idea that all truth is relatively true. And that means that there, there is no such thing as a, an objective standard or objective truth. And we talked about that. This is just a little bit of uh, uh, background of what we've been talking about. And true tolerance says that uh, I disagree with what you're saying, but you have the right to say it. And relativism says what you are arguing for is relative. Really, it doesn't make any difference because there's no absolute truth. And we, we arrived at that and discussed that the ph philosophical meaning of Relativism, relativism is that there is something other than God's word as a standard for truth. Now most of us, if not all of us, realize that the word of God is the ultimate standard, the objective standard of God's will uh, and God's truth. And uh, tonight I want to I want to talk about some some concepts that are that are part of the way the, that God has set up the Bible that we understand as being true, but there are many in the religious world that don't see and don't understand or maybe even disagree with some of these concepts we're going to look at tonight. I want to start tonight by asking a question. Why does authentic, now notice my terms here, why does authentic Christianity face opposition from today's people or today's uh, champions of so-called religious tolerance. Uh, why do, why are conservative Christians, Bible-believing, truth-teaching Christians persecuted and made fun of and called things like Pharisees and bigots and, and uh, everything you can think of in a negative way. Why is that the case even among religious people in the world today? Have you thought about that? That's what I want to talk about today. And the reason I believe is because Christianity, true Christianity, is diametrically opposed. That means it stands totally against the postmodern modern idea of subjective truth and or relativism. It's, it's, two, extreme, it's two opposite ends of, of uh, the standard. What we believe and what is true, what the Bible presents, is diametrically opposed to the subjective feeling only thought or philosophy that the postmodern or what we would refer to as liberalism knows today. And uh, I want to talk about these things because they're important that we realize 
these, I want to call their concepts, but I would rather call them pillars of understanding the Bible. When we understand the Bible, when we understand these concepts about God and about His Word and about the Bible, we will, we will be able not only to withstand the criticism and not be ashamed to, to uh, stand on the truth and be unapologetic in our stance and our teaching of the truth because we understand these basic principles and these pillars. And if we can get people to understand and to see these truths as they are presented in the Bible, well, maybe we can get them to follow the truth. I just think there's not a lot of teaching in the religious world and even among, in many places, our own brethren about these certain concepts that we want to deal with tonight. The first one we've already talked about a little bit, but I want to point to it specifically, and that is objectivity. There is one source of truth in the world today. There is one source of truth that is outside ourselves. And you see, right there is always, already a, a, uh, a conflict between the postmodern people and the conservative people or religious people. Because many in the in the philosophical postmodern era believe that truth is arrived by what? The truth on an issue has to do how how is how do you arrive at truth if you're a postmodern thinker? Huh? Your truth. It's inside yourself, what you think about it. You read the Bible, and as we talked about last week, it's your view of what God says. This is my faith. This is my belief. This is my opinion in, as to what God's Word says. Well, that's totally different than what the actual truth is. Yes, we have to believe the truth, but it's not my truth. It's not what, what I feel. It's what really is. And so there is a source of truth that is outside ourselves, and that's God's word. And brethren, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Because we all feel differently about things. We all look at things differently. Uh, we all have different opinions about everything. And if we view the Bible, if we view God's word like that, we're going to have a lot of disunity and a lot of difficulty in the religious world like we have. There's very little unity, and yet that's what exactly Jesus prayed for, that we might be united. United in what? In, in his truth. But God's word, according to the psalmist David in Psalm 119, verse 160, says the entirety, notice this, the entirety of your word is truth. All of it. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Now, that's pretty objective, isn't it? There is no subjectivity, no, no leaning right or left or indecision in that statement by, in, given to us by the inspired David. John 17, 17 Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth, thy work, by your truth, your word is truth. Who's he talking about? He's talking about God and he's speaking to his father and he's talking about the Bible. He's talking about the truth and the validity and the objectivity of the scriptures. And brethren, just, just imagine that, and I know most of us share, we understand this. But notice the power and the impactfulness there is when we understand that the Bible is objectively true. That means it's not subjective. That means it doesn't change. It doesn't, it doesn't flow with the wind. It, do, it isn't changed by culture or man's devices. It stays. It's objective. It's concrete. 
It's, that's why it is the foundation of man's faith. And that is a wonderful thing, but this objectivity is being attacked. It's being attacked by not only the, the society in which we live, it's being attacked in and among religious people, or so-called religious people. Yes. 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 Tony's pointing out that uh, isn't it ironic that God, having all truth, spoken all truth, and is going and we are going to be judged by his truth, is very tolerant. And tolerance, that is true in the true sense of the word tolerance. Not like the tolerance that, that we looked at last week, the tolerance of, well, I'll be tolerant as long as you you know, believe what I believe or don't outstep my boundaries. And, and uh, yes. And when you, when you point that out, Tony, it's, it's the case that God's tolerant, but there's going to be a time when God's objective truth is going to be the standard by which we're judged. And there will be no tolerance there. And he's tolerant now, wanting that all men everywhere would repent and obey the gospel and accept his terms of grace so that we all might go to heaven, but there's coming a time when we're going to stand before him in judgment and the tolerance is going to be over. At these times uh, of ignorance, God winked at, but now required all, requires all men everywhere to repent. Yes. God's word is true in the absolute sense, regardless of how anyone feels about it. Isn't that true? It doesn't matter how anybody feels about the Bible. It's true no matter what. That is a sense of, that should build in us a sense of confidence, a sense of strong faith, a sense of I'm in the right direction when I understand that. And, but this generation today finds this kind of view very distasteful. Very, you know, condescending. Have you ever, you ever heard anyone make that kind of statement? Well, you're, by, by telling that there's only one way or there's, you know, that the Bible is the objective standard, the only standard, that's pretty condescending. Or that's mean or that's arrogant or boastful. It's true. Now, we need to be as humble as we can, but that's true. And people need to know that because that's where faith begins. Did you have? Yeah, well, yeah, they claim that we're legalistic in believing that. Many seek to find truths within themselves. Remember last week we talked about, well, what this verse means to me? Ah, let's quit that. Let's quit that. I'm never going to say that. I hope I never say I'm going to say that again. Because it doesn't matter really what it means to me. It matters what God meant it to say to all of us. Now, if I believe it to say something, the Bible teaches me that I have the responsibility to prove what it says. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. I remember when I was at Bible college, we could stand up in chapel and, and preach any doctrine we wanted. But we had to defend it by book, chapter, and verse. Brethren, if you don't think you were prepared, or, or many times in chapel, we would get up and we would be asked Bible questions or, or to teach things concerning the Bible. And we would always have to prove them by book, chapter, and verse. Why? Because that's where objective truth comes from, the Word of God. Comments, questions? Okay, the Bible is God's revelation to humanity and its true meaning is determined by God. Its true meaning is determined by God, not by something to be shaped according to my preferences or my individual likes. If I don't like something that the Bible teaches, what am I supposed to do? Thank you. That's awful hard. That's awful rigid. You know, David. 
You know, that, you know, we're supposed to change our way of thinking? Absolutely. Why? Because God's word is not only objective, but it is also authoritative. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I, I want to... I want to talk about the second pillar. The first pillar is, is objectivity. And the second pillar is that God's word is rational. It's rational. And what I mean by rational is that it makes sense. That, it, that it's reasonable, that it's logical. And there's a lot of people in the world today that don't believe that. There's a lot of people in the religious world that don't believe that either. How can, how can faith be rational? I've heard many people, many so-called scholarly people, make the statement that, that faith is something other than rationality. That rationality brings you to a certain point, but then faith takes over, and that faith is how you get to God. Now, where's that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. That concept is very popular in our world today, and it's very popular even among religious people and even our own brethren. But that is not biblical faith. That's not how we arrive at faith. The Bible teaches that there, the, the Bible, as God's objective revelation, in order to be objective, in order to be God's revelation, end all, do all, it has to have no contradictions. Does anybody, can anyone tell me a contradiction in the Bible? A true contradiction. There's been writ books written about the contradiction in the Bible. But you know what? They've all been answered. There's been many other books written about the alleged discrepancies or the alleged contradictions in the Word of God that have totally exposed the error of those alleged contradictions. In order for the Bible to be rational, it must contain no contradiction. It must contain no errors. No errors. Now, what do I mean by no errors? Have humans made errors in translation? Are they proven to be errors? Yes, and we know what they are. Because they're inconsistent with the rest of Bible teaching. That's how you know if something isn't true. That's how you understand, that's how, that's rational. And there is no unsound principles taught in the pages of the New Testament or the Bible. Watch this, brethren, see if you, if you agree with this. If or anything that contradicts scripture, anything that contradicts scripture is false. You believe that? You believe that's a biblical teaching? It is. Anything that contradicts scripture is false. Well, how do I know if something is false? And how do I know if something is true? By understanding the scripture. By reading and understanding and using the, the rationality, the capacity of my mind that God has given me to determine what is true, what is not true, what is right, and what is not right. According to the scriptures. That's Bible study. That's a big word called hermeneutics. And it simply means hermeneutics is how we understand the Bible. You see, but the, but the relativists today, the postmodern theologians today, want to bring in a new hermeneutic. Have you ever heard that term? Have you read that recently? It's in our own brotherhood. And basically, I wanted to use this class to go through and critique a book that was written about the new hermeneutic. Why do we need a new hermeneutic if there's nothing wrong with the original hermeneutic? And if there's something wrong with the way I study and determine using rationality to determine the truth of God's word, show me, prove to me that it's wrong. 
hasn't been done. It isn't done in this new book either, by the way. Anything that contradicts scripture is false. In today's postmodern era, contradiction, absurdity, subjectivism are embraced. You're, you're bigoted, you're arrogant, you're, you're, what did somebody use the term? What did you say? Legalistic if you hold to absolute standard of truth. And yet that's exactly what God's word teaches. And if you, if you get into this corner where you, well, you know, I don't, I don't really know. We can't say for sure that baptism is for the remission of sins. We can't say for sure that, you know, how the Holy Spirit leads. We can't, we don't know for sure a lot of these things. So we just better just go along and get along. No, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. I want you to turn, if you would, over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, and notice this passage of Scripture. Titus chapter 1, look at verse 1. The Bible says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, watch this now, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of What's the word acknowledgement mean, simply put? Recognized, okay, good, understood. And the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Now I want to read that all together now. A bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. What? Verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time, now, manifested or brought to light his word through preaching, which was committed to me, Paul, as an apostle, according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now, brethren, when you read that statement <clears throat> and statement like statements like that in the Bible that God cannot lie, it's impossible for God to lie, then you must conclude that God does not contradict himself and that everything he says is exactly the way he determined it to be said. And it's up to me <clears throat> as a disciple, as a learner, as a follower, to determine what he says in his word and make application to my life. And to preach it like the other apostles did, as he talks about here. Perfect, the, the word of God is perfectly consistent with himself. That's what Paul is teaching here. Now, here's the bottom line. Understanding this, understanding that the Bible is reasonable, that means it's black and white when it's meant to be black and white and not gray. There are things in the, in, in the New Testament, in the Bible, that are black and white. They're specifically stated, they're directly commanded, they're, in, they're, in, they're implicitly implied or implied by the scriptures, and they're rational. That means they flow, they make sense, they're not, they're not, they're consistent. So when I use the, the brain that God has given me along with the heart, I, I can come to a conclusion that is exactly what God desires. Well, what if I only use my heart? Is that going to, am I going to arrive at truth? Not necessarily. Not unless I implore my, my ability to ration and, and uh, uh, understand and uh, determine what the Bible teaches. Rationality is a part of the Word of God. I remember back when I was in uh, 
Bible college, we were in a class on logic. And uh, it was very, it was symbolic logic. It's very difficult for me to understand. It's a lot of, it's like math. It's like, it's like trigonometry. It's, it was very, very important. You've got all these truth tables and you put in these arguments and it comes out and it always comes out true. <laughs> and that, it was very hard, but what I got, and I don't even, I don't think I did well in that class. Uh, but one thing I did learn from that class is that rationality, thank you, rationality is part of the Bible. And I need to be logical. I may not understand all the truth tables and I may not understand all the sim symbolism or the symbolic logic, but I need to know that if the Lord says it and he says it, it's true and I need to do it. Or if he says not to do it, I need not to do it. That's black and white. That's basically rationality and logic. Comment? Mm. Please, I'm dying here. Yes. Yes. That's how, as Timothy says, Peter says that the Bible is its own best interpreter, and that's exactly the case. Because what you need to do in order to understand the Bible is you need to know a lot about the Bible. You need to know the history. You need to know the dispensations. You need to know the characters. You, and, and how do you learn that? Well, you don't feel it. You study it. It's all in there. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything we need to know is in here. But we have to take the time and the dedication not only to study it, but also discuss and even sometimes, brethren, argue it in a Christian sense of argumentation. To prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. There's going to come a time when we disagree. We disagree on a lot of things. And it's okay to disagree, but just like down at Tennessee Bible College, if you disagree, prove your point. And if you prove your point, it's up to me, if it's true, to follow you. Yes. Well, yeah, and what they want to believe, because it's easy. Yes. Right, right. That's right. Macon says people just want to believe what they want to believe today, and that's the problem. And that's the problem, and they get, around, they get around that by making fun of those of us who understand the objectivity of the Bible and the rationality of the Bible and the authority of the Bible and what God wants me to do with his word, and they don't like that. It, it causes them undue hardship if they don't want to change. Good. Third, yes. As a guide, yes. But what is the Bible? Is it a guide? It's a pattern. It's a map. What happens? I'm not. I don't want to go there. What happens if you don't follow the map? You get lost. Some of you do. Some of us can find our own way. But no, that's right. That's a that's a beautiful illustration. I found myself many times lost in backtracking because I didn't follow the way I should have went on the road and or otherwise. Yes? Okay. Third pillar is accuracy. And again, these kind of overlap, but, but we need to understand that the Bible, if it's objective, if it's rational, it has to be accurate. It has to be every, it has to be complete. It has to be consistent. If the Bible is not accurate, if it isn't consistent, it isn't God's word. And if it isn't God's word, we are like men, all men most miserable when we pattern our lives in harmony with it. Wouldn't you rather, in a human perspective, just go do whatever you wanted to anytime and just, just throw rationality to the wind and just go have a great time? Well, that's what the majority of the world does. That's why we don't do that because God's will is accurate. It tells us that we shouldn't do that if we want to go to heaven and take people with us. 2 Timothy 3, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, King James says, perfect, 
thoroughly furnished or equipped for every good work. The Bible gives us everything we need to know about life. What if, let me ask you a question. What if the Bible doesn't address something in our life? I would too because it addresses everything. But let's just say you came up with something that the Bible doesn't address. Well, it does address it. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks by its silence. But if we come up with something in our life that the Bible doesn't address, we don't need that. We don't need that to be godly. We don't need that to be the kind of person that God wants us to be. We don't need it if it doesn't address it because this verse, 2 Timothy 3.17, tells us that everything we need to know for life and godliness is in his word. Everything. It's accurate. What other book can tell you that? How much money and time and energy is, is exuded toward self-help books in the world today? How to be a better person. How to be happy. How to, how to be successful in life. What did, what did Solomon say, who was the most worldly successful person in the whole world ever? What did he say the conclusion of the whole matter is? Fear God and keep his commandments. Huh. I wonder how he knew that. All right, accuracy. Running out of time. Looking good, though. <clears throat> okay, so I want to get to this next point. Authority. God's word is authoritative. It is the authority in the whole world. You want, to, you want to think about power? You want to think about the top of the mountain? It's God and his word that he gave to us. There's a, there's a, I tried to look it up, but I didn't, I didn't have time to count them all. But there's a phrase throughout the pages of the Old and the New Testament. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Friends and brethren, when we read that, and we get to that point in our life, thus saith the Lord, that means we better obey. That means we're, we're standing in, in, in the sight or we're under the authority of God, the creator and the sustainer of this universe. Because the scripture is true, we can teach people and must teach people the truth without apologizing for it and without compromise. Because it is the sole authority. Brethren, how much stronger would our personal evangelism be if we really understand and really take to heart that we don't have to apologize about the Bible? We don't have to apologize by stating that God is sovereign and everything that he stands for in this world is absolutely true. We don't have to apologize for that. We shouldn't apologize for that. But have you ever thought when you're teaching someone the scripture or someone the truth, well, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. No, no, we're not. We shouldn't be because we're helping that person understand what God would have them to do. Now, it may be difficult for them to change. They may not want to change. They may refuse to change. But at least we tell them what they, must, what they, should, what they need to do and we don't need to apologize for it. We don't need to compromise the truth and water it down. Or try to make it something that it isn't. You ever heard anybody say to a member of the body of Christ, so you people down there at Church of Christ, you think you know everything about the Bible. You ever heard anybody say that? I have. You people down there, you think you know everything. Do we know everything about the Bible? About God's word? Absolutely not. But. I may not know everything, but we do know some things. We do know some things. And those some things we know, we know because they're true and they're accurate and they're rational and they're authoritative. And I don't need to be ashamed of what I know. 
the Bible teaches. Comment? Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. Rich says that, that the idea of being under authority of God seems to the, to the world today by being weak. Uh, and it's totally opposite. It is totally opposite. It's weak if you do what you just want to and don't submit to the authority of God in his work. Very good. All right, I want to get to uh, the uh, next one, and that is, this, is the, this might be the one that gets us mostly in trouble, or most in trouble, and that is the exclusive, <laughs> I knew I practiced this, I practiced this, the exclusivity, the exclusivity of the Word of God. The word exclusive, Exclusivity is translated or is defined as the practice of excluding or not admitting certain things. Now, is exclusive <laughs> is exclusivity a bad word or a good word? Huh? It's neutral. Okay. But I think it's a bad word. It's a bad word sometimes. Absolutely. It's in the con it, it's good or bad in the context that it's being used. Sometimes if you exclude a person for no or exclude an activity for no reason or because you're mean or ugly, that's that's a bad thing. But the word of God is exclusive. It absolutely is. Notice, Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, I am the way the truth and the life is that exclusive is that admitting everybody else he says no one comes to the father except through me well don't you know there's other world religions out there that that don't recognize jesus as being the son of god and don't recognize him as being deity aren't they okay not according to the savior See the exclusivity of the statement that Jesus made? Peter said in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's exclusive, isn't it? That, that, that takes out everybody except who? Jesus. Well, that's pretty exclusive. Is that a bad thing? No. God's word is exclusive, but God wants everybody to be a part of his kingdom. It's an exclusive kingdom made for everybody, whosoever will. But it is exclusive to those who don't want to be a part of it and don't want to do adhere to the teaching of his word. John, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 21, the end of the verse, it says, And no lie is of the truth. And no lie is of the truth. So, Whatever contradicts the Bible, whatever contradicts the truth of the scriptures is what? Why? That's rational. False. Anything that contradicts the word of God is false. Anything. Yes. Okay. The only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is obedience. Ultimately, I would say that that's consistent with biblical teaching. All right, I have to conclude here. Unfortunately, many in the religious world today, and even among our own fellowship, are moving away from these basic Bible pillars. 
Galatians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul said, Do you hate me because I teach the truth? Brethren, we need to teach all of these pillars. We need to understand them because it incorporates our faith. It, we recognize what our faith is when we understand God and his word to the extent that he's given it to us. But fewer and fewer Christians are willing to stand against postmodern ideas and, and, post and, and stand against the criticism. You know, people, I don't want to preach all that stuff. That's hard and people aren't going to like me. Well, they may not. But the Bible teaches that those that love the truth and have a good and honest heart, that the word is powerful and it is, it is able to, to pierce a person's heart and weigh down in them and make them obey the truth. And it's the word that's going to do that. It's not you. So we need to preach the word. We must reject postmodern teaching and hold fast to the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Thank you for your good attention and your comments tonight. We'll be dismissed.